If you were a kid who grew up in the 80s, 90s, or 2000s, then you'll probably remember Chuck E. Cheese for how big of an establishment it was throughout the decades. It was one of those places you had to visit as a kid, and I even remember going to one of my local spots for a friend's birthday party. While I was pretty freaked out by the animatronics and the way they moved back then, over the past few years of researching lost media, it's gotten me more interested in revisiting the Chuck E. Cheese brand to discuss some of the lost content from the larger rabbit hole of the company's history. With help from Nostalgia Cow and the 64th Gamer, there is a large variety of lost and rare content that their community is very dedicated to getting unearthed. And hopefully, with some new spotlight on these topics from the lost media community, more content from them can be seen. Let's start the video off with one of my favorite searches that I came across during my own exploration. When you think about lost media from Chuck E. Cheese and its related brands, one of the first categories that probably comes to mind are the animatronics themselves, because they're such a large part of the Pizza Time Theater experience. But you might be wondering how exactly animatronics can go missing in the first place, and there will be a few different examples in this video on what counts. But for this topic, I want to discuss one of the most fascinating lost animatronics that I've ever come across. This is about an animatronic character named Wolfman Zap, who was not used in any Chuck E. Cheese location, but rather, he was the main character featured in his own line of restaurants, called Zap's Bar and Grill. Contrary to the kid's style of Chuck E. Cheese restaurants, Zap's Bar and Grill was catered to an older crowd, and was considered the adult equivalent to Chuck E. Cheese. However, very little is even known about Zap's Bar and Grill at all, due to the fact that the chain was short-lived, and proved not to be a successful venture at all. With the only content from it that's readily available, being a series of old articles and interviews, where Zap's Bar and Grill was discussed early on in its life. In fact, the restaurant itself could be considered lost media, for the fact that not a single photo or video from inside the bar has ever resurfaced. We have no idea what it even looked like. Though this does make some sense as, since it was a bar, there would be no real reason for patrons to film themselves inside of it, unlike families that take home recordings of their kids at Chuck E. Cheese. The majority of locations for Zap's Bar and Grill were opened near the West Coast, so if there was ever a chance for some homemade content to show up, it would most likely be from around that area of the country. Now, Zap's Bar and Grill as a location is one story, but the character of Wolfman Zap is another because while he's mostly remained as elusive as the bar and grill he was named after, there has been some very interesting information and sightings of the character since his creation. Firstly, as we've never seen any photos of the inside of the restaurant, it's not known where or how exactly Zap performed in it, or if he even performed at all. At the time, character animatronics used show tapes, which are the programming and audio information that allowed them to come alive so it would be reasonable to conclude that Wolfman Zap had one as well, but none have ever been found. The Lost Media Wiki article speculated that Zap may have used some adult humor in his set for the fact that it was an adult restaurant, but that's completely unconfirmed. Though even if a show tape for the character was found, we would still need some kind of video showing how he moved to get a full understanding of what he performed like. It's also not known if Zap was a retrofitted animatronic meaning his insides are that of an already existing character, but got its clothing changed on the outside, or if he's a completely new creation altogether. Only a handful of pictures showing the character in one piece have resurfaced, and for a long time, these were the only ones available, until a miraculous find. In July 2015, it was discovered through an Instagram post that an animatronic with a striking resemblance to Wolfman Zap had been spotted in the back of a pickup truck. This image has been widely circulated online, and led to speculation about how recent the photo was or if this was even a Wolfman Zap animatronic at all. While the original post has been deleted, another photo would show up sometime later, from Tumblr, showing another angle of the same setup. It seems like the character was attached to the truck in the front, rather than being in the back, and this is for good reason. Apparently, this vehicle is used in the Carson Valley Days Parade run by the 2030 Club out of Nevada. That makes a lot of sense, considering Zap's Bar and Grill had a location in Reno, Nevada. Nostalgia Cow confirmed these details, but was unable to verify if Wolfman Zap was still part of the parade, 
or get any new pictures of him. If you compare the animatronic to some of the photos where he has his glasses on, it's a little hard to tell if it's the same one, but there's one picture that matches up almost perfectly. There couldn't have been many of these made, if there were only five locations, so it's a mystery how this ended up in a parade at all, or if we'll ever see another one. As with most series that have a long history dating back decades, the rabbit hole of Chuck E. Cheese Lost Media is very large, and within it, there are a few pieces that remain desired compared to everything else, especially when there's a single piece still missing from a larger collection of material that has all been found. If you've ever been to a Chuck E. Cheese restaurant from the old days, you'll notice that in addition to the animatronic shows that are performed, sometimes they'll perform what's called a live show. This is when a character or two appears in a full body costume and dances around interacting directly with the audience. There are even some stage setups that allow for Chucky to disappear when the mascot Chucky appears, which preserves the illusion that the character really exists and there's only one of him. Another aspect of these live shows can be found on the screens behind the characters while the live show is going on. Usually, these screens will play some kind of visual that goes along with the animatronics as they perform, but during the live shows, special videos would play, and this is where the topic for this segment begins. It's become one of the most desired pieces of Chuck E. Cheese Lost Media, and it's known as Strike It Up. Strike It Up is a live show that was performed in restaurants from August 1996 to November 1996, a very short period of time, and like I mentioned before, this one used costume characters. Now, there's a lot of content online already featuring this show. However, it's the footage that was played on the TV in the background which has not been archived yet. The community has rips of nearly every VHS and DVD show tape that were used for the other live shows that were performed, but not this one, and it's become the most desired for that reason, though content from it isn't completely lost. In some of those home recordings of the live show, you can see some of the Strike It Up video played on the screens in the background, and even the audio itself has been preserved from Chuck E. Cheese Corporate. However, this is largely all that's been recovered. The only other content that exists for it is a one second clip that was taken from the Studio C premiere show tape from 1998, providing the first and only clean rip of the footage so far. Keep in mind that Strike It Up wasn't just a test performance or something that wasn't used nationwide. Every restaurant had copies of it, so it's particularly strange that none have resurfaced by now. Although there is a little bit of controversy in terms of who has a copy since no one in the community is known to have one, and only one has been seen before. One of the workers from Chuck E. Cheese Corporate teased owning the master tape on one of his live streams, pretended to rip it to DVD, and then cut the DVD with scissors. Apparently he gets asked often to play Strike It Up on his streams, and it was actually from one of his live streams where we got that picture of the tape in its original format. It's up for debate about whether or not any more copies exist, but I've personally been told that Chuck E. Cheese Corporate doesn't preserve their history in a meaningful way, and have become known for destroying their own archive. It's possible they could have thrown out the rest of their copies. Another fascinating part of Chuck E. Cheese Lost Media, and one that you might not even think about having lost media, relates to the actual stage setups that were used in the restaurants. While I'm still learning a lot about each one and the evolution that would follow as they were updated over the years, I remember getting really interested in some of the earlier ones that were made, like the portrait show, which was the only way you could see Krusty the Cat perform before he was replaced, and how one Utah location still had the portrait show in operation 12 years after it was officially retired. But apparently not all stages even get past the testing phase, and there is one that has become quite famous over the years for its complexity and rarity, having shown up in very few visuals. This is the Awesome Adventure Machine stage, a stage show that would reinvent Chuck E. Cheese in a way that would be more eye-catching and relevant to kids growing up in the 90s. At the time, competing brands like Discovery Zone were making Chuck E. Cheese rethink the way it could entertain kids, leading to the idea of updating the old animatronics to something more modern and putting more emphasis on video content. This would eventually become the basis for Awesome Adventure Machine, a new direction for the brand that contained a single Chuck E. Cheese animatronic in the center of the stage, surrounded by two massive 10-foot TVs that would take viewers around the world on adventures. Chucky acted as the pilot in this setup and was surrounded by a cast of side characters 
who were made from household objects and replaced the main cast that had always been at the restaurant up to that point. There were also a series of special lighting effects and an LED board above Chucky that could display messages and designs, all hiding behind a vertical sliding door instead of the traditional curtains seen in other stage setups. While it was definitely a completely different style than that of previous iterations, this stage debuted in August 1996 at the Monford store in Dallas, Texas, to high praise. While the people loved it, corporate did not see it that way, and instead decided that it would be way too expensive to install nationwide, on top of the fact that technicians had a hard time maintaining it with so many moving intricate parts. As a result, the awesome adventure machine was never rolled out to any other locations and remained as a test in the Monford store. It also never featured any special themed shows around the holidays as other locations would. However, it remained up and running in this location until late 1997, when it was replaced with the Studio C prototype, though that one did contain many concepts from Awesome Adventure Machine itself. Apparently the trademark for Awesome Adventure Machine was abandoned shortly after being applied for in May 1996, so even after its debut a few months later, it seems like corporate knew it was not going to see a long run. For years following this test run, there was no content available online showing the stage at all, until a former programmer named Brian Hagen released what would be the first clips and a photo in March 2002. However, this was the only content available for over 20 years, until the VP of Marketing, John Rice, released more material that showed it after being contacted by Nostalgia Cow. Finally, Brian Hagen would return again to upload archival footage of the Awesome Adventure Machine show, and at last it had been found. Though there's a secondary piece of lost content from it that's still lost, a private preview that was held at the Montford store before it officially premiered. The audio has been released for it, but not the video. There was also a news report that local affiliate WFFA ABC Dallas filmed from this preview, but nothing from that has resurfaced either. Curiously, there also haven't been any home video recordings of the show to appear, despite how long the stage was up for the public. While none of this other content is specifically needed, it would be nice to archive more of this iteration. And it's always fun seeing the home recordings with the live audience reactions to give us a feel of what it was really like to see something like this live back in the day. I feel like it wouldn't be a real Chuck E. Cheese Lost Media video without revisiting a topic that hasn't really gained too much attention since I last covered it, but hopefully can get some new light shed on it, since it very much seems like something that only the fans will be able to unearth. When this topic first broke last year, it was a pretty big deal for the fact that nobody knew it existed at all, and it was in this shock where the search sort of began. It was in a video on YouTube that user I'm Not Jonathan came across showcasing the collection of Smitty's Super Service Station, which is basically a museum of Chuck E. Cheese animatronics and memorabilia. There's so much content in this museum, and the tour videos are often so long, it takes someone with a lot of knowledge about Chuck E. Cheese to spot something like this topic. 50 minutes into the tour, the owner of the collection named Damon shows a book that contains animation cells from what is said to be a commercial for Chuck E. Cheese and a newspaper clipping mentioning an animated TV spot. Together, these two pieces of evidence prove that a TV spot was said to have aired and the cells are the remnants of that piece. At the time, details were very hard to come by but some community members did uncover never-before-documented details about it, including that it only aired locally in California, sometime around the 1980s. It was also 30 seconds long and advertised birthday parties. These details are backed up by an employee newspaper from around the same time, that also mentioned a 30-second commercial that would be airing on TV, and another brochure that mentions the ad is part of a marketing TV package. Though aside from this evidence that points towards the commercial's existence, nobody seems to remember it exactly, and nothing visually from it has resurfaced besides the collection of cells. In fact, if it wasn't for these cells, and the fact that they were so heavily noticed by the community, I'm sure the commercial would still remain in obscurity, and nobody would have any idea that it existed in this way. It's interesting how the details seem to be in plain sight the whole time, which makes for a more interesting search. While there are no other visuals that we currently have, the cells have been scanned and run together to give us some kind of idea of what the commercial looked like, though I and many others would really like to see the whole piece. 
At the time, there was an idea thrown around that the company who animated it was called Colossal Pictures. While the storyboards were claimed to have been drawn by someone else, an artist who drew comics sold in the Pizza Time Theater restaurants. Though as far as I can tell, there hasn't been any exchange between former employees or animators at the company and the community itself, so perhaps this is still an area with possibilities to uncover. But aside from taking the contact route to get this commercial found, brings us to a hands-on effort that I always like to mention for these kinds of searches, and that's the fact that it aired locally. We know from the details previously uncovered that it aired locally in the 1980s, allegedly for a couple months, in the Stockton and Huntington Beach area of California. Most Pizza Time Theater restaurants were located in this area at the time, so it makes sense that the ad would have aired there. There was a list of TV stations that were active in the area at the time, which was compiled for reference. So combine that list with the knowledge that it aired locally, then you get a really good lead. If anyone from that part of the country remembers growing up during that time and recording TV content, you might have a piece of lost media in your collection. Though if this route doesn't give us any new leads, there is still the Colossal Pictures option, who were absorbed by bigger companies after having gone defunct in 1999. But they had a huge body of work while they were operating, and I'd be surprised if that content was not archived by the people who took over and simply tossed away. So we still have two leads that are full of possibilities to look at, in trying to get this animated piece of Chuck E. Cheese Lost Media found. Circling back to Lost Animatronics, there are quite a few more that exist in a similar way to Wolfman Zap, that are fascinating to come across online. It's amazing just how many physical objects like these have gone undocumented without any videos showing them in action, or show tapes that have resurfaced so we can hear how they performed. For a really long time I was quite fascinated with Family Album and Hot Fudge. These were two test bands that were used at only five locations during Pizza Time Theater's bankruptcy period, and at the time I had discovered their existence, there were no videos online showing either in action. However, there has since been some old home recordings that the community ended up finding, so now the small portion of time from when they were around has been documented. But even still, there are more lost animatronics, both on video and physically, that might never resurface again. The first one is quite famous within the community, a character from the early days of Pizza Time Theater, who appears as a duck sporting headphones and a striped shirt with suspenders. He is commonly referred to as Dr. Ducks or DJ Duck, for the fact that he was never given an official name, because he was a character only created for testing purposes. In fact, photos of him remained lost for quite some time, until he appeared in two that were taken at the corporate office back in the day, though their exact date is not known. To this day, these are the only pictures of Dr. Ducks that have ever been seen, though the Lost Media Wiki article mentions that the show tape used to test with him was found. This tape in particular is also the same tape, whose label contains text that reads Dr. Ducks, possibly providing proof that this was his intended name. But since he was never released, it's not completely confirmed. Nobody has seen this animatronic since these photos were taken, and it's not known if one even still exists today. Another two animatronics who both remain quite elusive are later iterations of the character Uncle Clunk. This character was originally a guest character that was installed at some showbiz pizza locations, replacing Earl on the right stage, but was eventually retired entirely after the merger between Chuck E. Cheese and Showbiz Pizza. But with so many leftover Uncle Clunk animatronics, they were eventually reused and repurposed into other projects that were test marketed to audiences for a short period of time. One of these tests was called Orwell, a robot you control, which reused Uncle Clunk by removing the cosmetics of the character on one side to expose all the inner mechanisms and adding a button panel that allowed for the animatronic to move in different ways when pressed, so kids could see how everything really worked. I'm sure this concept was a great way to reuse what they already had, but to me it almost ruins the illusion that the characters on stage project. Orwell was placed in the showroom and could be activated by inserting a token, but nobody has seen this animatronic in action since the days when he was originally used. Only a couple pictures of Orwell exist, one of the split Uncle Clunk animatronic, and another version that shows the insides without anything else. Interestingly, audio for this character has resurfaced, but no video of him in action, or the original physical setup that was used. The second version of Uncle Clunk that was test marketed was a new character named Uncle Pappy, who was an old western man 
who was also placed in the showroom and operated on a token similar to Orwell. This character was known to sing songs and tell kids the do's and don'ts, having been voiced by the same actor that performed Chuck E. Cheese. For a long time, Uncle Pappy had no audio available online, and only a couple pictures. Until recently, audio was posted from the time when he was operational, though it's not known which location he was tested in. While these characters were short-lived in the entire Chuck E. Cheese timeline, they do play a role in its history, as all of the topics do in this video. Hopefully with new eyes and ears discovering Chuck E. Cheese Lost Media, we can uncover more of its content and preserve an iconic piece of American pop culture history. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to check out some of my other Lost Media videos. Thanks for watching, and until next time, Finn.